Hello, I'm Brett Lazundia, and I was the ERI's co-leader for the Nepal earthquake reconnaissance effort. This presentation is a summary of our findings from our reconnaissance team. It's a combination of all the other presentations that ERI has put together to help people better understand the earthquake, what we observed, and what conclusions and recommendations we drew from that. This is part of a larger uh, series of briefings. It's the last in that series. Uh, the list is here. They're available for your viewing pleasure. And we would encourage you for more details to look carefully at those and ones that interest you. This will be, by its very necessity, uh, just a summary of key points from various presentations. So there's much more to be learned and, and many interesting details that I won't be able to go over in this presentation. As part of our effort in organizing this, uh, perhaps the most important thing that we did is we partnered with the National Society of Earthquake Technology in Nepal. That's an organization that has been dedicated to improving earthquake resistance and resilience in Nepal for many years. And they were effective and, and critical in enabling us to meet with the key people that we needed to uh, interview, discuss issues with. And it was really incredibly successful. And, and beneficial. We also assembled a very large multidisciplinary uh, team members from all around the world. Uh, we assigned them uh, strategic objective tasks to carry out. For the first time, ERI established a role called a virtual team collaborator. These are uh, typically younger professionals who have helped us, uh, each team member, prepare slides, investigate issues, prepare presentations, and, and will help us as we move forward with report efforts as well. We uh, coordinated with uh, the myriad of reconnaissance teams. We visited both the urban Kathmandu area, the surrounding value, but we also went uh, far afield into the much more heavily damaged areas to, uh, to look at what occurred there also. Uh, one of the most interesting things that I think we've done with this is begin the process of a longitudinal study on selected communities to understand what happened before the event, how well prepared were they, what happened during the earthquake. Uh, at the time of our visit, five to six weeks later, we interviewed people, tried to understand uh, what their plans were for recovery. And ERI will be sending uh, teams back later uh, this year and, and next year to go back to these communities and understand the process of recovery. Uh, our focus here is on resilience and, and how that's shaping up uh, in the coming months in these communities. I mentioned that we established uh, strategic objectives. Uh, I think this is quite important based on my past experience in, in earthquake reconnaissance efforts. So these were largely accomplished. Uh, each team member had several objectives and, and was uh, passionate about uh, investigating them. Our team, here's a snapshot of most of the members on the team. Uh, they are drawn from all over the world. They're multidisciplinary, a hallmark of, of ERI's uh, large community of people. And uh, I'm quite proud of all of them. They did a wonderful job. Uh, here's a, kind of a plan view of several different uh, overlays. So this is Nepal. In the center of the slide, the big uh, star, that is the main shock. And then the smaller stars were some critical large aftershocks. The, the cross-hatched areas are where we went. Uh, we investigated most of the heavily damaged areas. MMI has reached up to eight and perhaps nine in a few areas, and we visited uh, those key areas. Here's a larger view of that. Kathmandu, the capital, is in the center here. These are districts that are kind of like states uh, in America where uh, we went to at least two portions of them. We have geocoded uh, nearly half of the 11,000 photographs so far that we took. And the, the blue dots give you a feel for where we went in, in some of these districts. Uh, so an overview of the earthquake itself and, and sort of a briefing on what is Nepal was provided by my team co-leader, Surya Shrita. He is a deputy director at ENSE in Nepal. And uh, you know what is the human toll uh, is perhaps the, the most important and, and the saddest part of any earthquake. Uh, despite its large magnitude and, uh, and uh, the, the heavy shaking, the, the deaths were perhaps less than, than some might have expected, though they're still quite large. 
they were focused almost entirely in Nepal with uh, some in surrounding countries. There is a report that has been prepared by my many people, uh, including the government of Nepal and the World Bank and, and a lot of consultants that has been issued. And this summarizes by different categories what happened uh, to archaeological sites, what happened to school sites. So the earthquake, as all earthquakes do, affected many different aspects of society and infrastructure and, and what is important in people's lives. More details are, of course, provided in that report and in Surya's presentation. Kishore Jaiswal from USGS uh, was a member of our team, and, and he has put together a briefing on the seismological aspects of the area and the ground motions that have been recorded. This is a cross-sectional view uh, of the country. On the, to the south, to the left, is India, to the middle, that's Nepal, and China would be to the right. Uh, so this is a subduction zone area of the world where the Indian plate is subducting underneath the Eurasian plate, and that's what's producing the earthquakes of significance that have created the tectonic environment and the, and the geography of the country. If we look at the, the main recording that's been released so far, this is uh, in the the capital of Kathmandu where this occurred, uh, and we look at response spectra from the main shock here in the upper left, and one of the most striking features of this that's caught many people's attention is that out in the four to five second range, the spectral accelerations are much larger than in the short period range, at least in one direction. That's in the east-west direction. Uh, interestingly, and, and kind of less well appreciated, is there these spikes over here, that's in the north-south direction. So it wasn't quite consistent between the two. In the aftershocks, once, uh, several of those main aftershocks, the amplification out here in the longer period uh, areas was not as significant. So Kishore has uh, provided some findings. So these are drawn. These conclusions are drawn directly from his presentation, and that's the approach I'll be taking as we move forward through the other disciplines here. Uh, at the moment, there's only one record, uh, the one that I showed, that's available. There are others, and, and so when they are released, that I'm sure will enhance our understanding of what occurred. Uh, accelerations are relatively small. High, uh, velocities are high. Uh, this is not well understood yet. Uh, may have to do with the way the uh, source rupture occurred. Uh, besides the, the long period shaking that I mentioned, uh, it's, it's possible that's partly due to basin response, but may not be the full story there. And the combination of, of main shocks and aftershocks obviously contributed significantly to what occurred as far as damage. Hemant Kashak is a professor in India. He uh, looked uh, primarily at uh, RC frame buildings with masonry infill. That's one of the major building types that we see in Nepal. Uh, it uh, affected uh, shorter, medium, and taller buildings. Uh, in, in many cases, the buildings were fine. In other cases, we saw damage like we see here where due to foundation issues, there was significant tilting or pounding. Uh, buildings at the top of bridges were heavily impacted, uh, and many were closed uh, and, and uh, not available for reoccupancy. Uh, I also was interested in buildings. I'm a structural engineer, and, and so uh, together with several of our colleagues on the team, we looked at unreinforced masonry bearing wall buildings. That's the other main type in the upper left here. We also looked at post-earthquake safety evaluations or tagging of buildings or placarding as it's known in some places. And you can see in the town of Chitara here, the red circle represents a red dot. Um, that that spray painted dot with a red tag or an unsafe tag. The yellow dot is a limited, um, limited entry tag. And uh, typically, though, the evaluation process involved evaluator going to the site, coming to a conclusion, and speaking with the uh, homeowners or the tenants or primarily the building owner. But placards were usually not placed on the buildings. That's an interesting choice that was made uh, that has not been made in other parts of the world. Uh, many of these buildings you know, are potentially going to threaten the public thoroughfare or neighbors 
for pedestrians in aftershocks. Uh, and so barricading was generally not observed in most places. You can see the example of this building here. Uh, even if they had put barricades, uh, things are built very close together, so it would be difficult to meet uh, guidelines that are used in some places of being you know, one and a half times the, the falling height away. Uh, one of the great success stories, I thought, was uh, back in about 2000, Nepal began retrofitting its older school buildings, such as an uh, unreinforced masonry building like this. Uh, that involved um, putting uh, concrete bands, vertical and horizontal, you can see them here on these schools, and, and our understanding is they did extremely well, uh, very little damage, and this has led to increased efforts uh, in improving new schools and as they're built with similar technology. So our conclusions um, for uh, the buildings that we saw, uh, we, we have many, and I'll just highlight a few. Uh, the the non-engineered buildings, of which represents the, the majority of the buildings, did not do as well as the engineered. Buildings that were on uh, slopes uh, performed quite poorly. We saw extensive evidence of the seismic code that has been in Nepal since 1994 not being followed and, and detailing being done with non-ductile details. Uh, bearing wall buildings usually performed uh, noticeably worse than RC frame buildings and, and the worse the construction and the worse the quality of materials, not surprisingly, the worse they did. Um, the amount of post-earthquake safety evaluations was, was quite vast, uh, up to 60,000 uh, evaluations had been done at the time we were there, uh, but they're being done by a number of different organizations, so pulling that all together and providing a consistent level of quality and coordination will be challenging. Uh, we saw many buildings where they were red tagged and yet people were still occupying them, uh, so it, it's not entirely clear if, if the people living there fully understood the, uh, the meaning of the tag or if they simply you know, chose due to lack of other alternatives to stay. Uh, we thought the school retrofit program uh, should grow. There's many, many schools that are left to retrofit, and, and certainly Nepal has plans to do that. We had a team of, of people led by Judy Matrani Reiser and Hari Kumar uh, and, and their colleagues who looked at the performance of healthcare facilities primarily hospitals in a number of different places in Kathmandu and in the surrounding districts. And this slide is a reminder of, of what they look at uh, when they are interviewing and, and going through their evaluation of the many issues that it takes to keep a hospital functional. It's not just enough that the building is not significantly damaged. We have to have the staff able to get there. We have to have a staff that's uh, prepared. We have to have equipment that functions, utilities that function, the supplies needed. Uh, and so, you know, at any one place we can have issues, and, and they certainly saw a number of, of issues when they were there. In the end, it's quite a wide spectrum of performance uh, and functionality that was observed. In some places, it, there's a lot of room for improvement. In other places, the facilities did extremely well, and, and their level of preparedness uh, is really a model for uh, many parts of the world, including the U.S. Interestingly, despite the level of shaking or the level of, in some cases, very limited or minimal damage, all the facilities evacuated, and, and this has been observed in past earthquakes as well. I think there's a heightened level of sensitivity with hospitals. So that forced many hospitals to function uh, or set up functioning alternatives outside in tents, and, and, and that worked. Uh, of course, it's, it's not as optimal as people would like us. Uh, they had been well aware of the level of seismicity in, that Nepal has been predicting for many years and, and had uh, worked on disaster preparedness. Uh, utilities uh, worked uh, for the most part with their backup systems quite well. There are some recommendations for future work that, that came out of this. Uh, the level of uh, design for hospitals, you know, art is something needed uh, to, to a higher standard. We have that in, in many parts of the world. Uh, it sort of raises the question, because a number of hospitals had fairly severe damage. Uh, limited uh, non-structural seismic anchorage and bracing, so I think improved uh, consideration of that and implementation of that is important. 
Uh, one of the particularly unique things, and, and what I found particularly fascinating, is, is Courtney Welton Mitchell of our team. Uh, her specialty, among other things, is mental health issues in disasters, including earthquakes. And so she went to look and to interview uh, many, many people in, in all walks of life in the event. Uh, and to try and better understand social, psychological, and cultural factors. And she, she looked at many things, but including, you know, what did people attribute the cause of the earthquake to? It's a heavily religious society, and um, there are some attributions related to that. Uh, others uh, understood the tectonic environment, and, and reconciling that to those two attributions uh, was, was interesting to understand, and, and it has implications for uh, people's level of fatalism and, and what their plans were moving forward. Uh, we we heard many stories beneath the surface about the challenges and, and difficulty of people suffering, not just uh, physically and not just from lost homes, but also mentally uh, with uh, all levels of depression and, and other mental health issues that, that will be incredibly important as they attempt to rebuild. Uh, you can see on the upper right here, that's a tent that was set up in one of the settlement camps to care for kids and to give them, you know, a, a more pleasant environment. The, the photo on the bottom right, those, that's a community successfully working together to uh, completely rebuild. Uh, but there were other ends of the spectrum as well where there was ethnic differences and, and challenges that uh, will be very significant as they try and move forward. Uh, it's a very diverse country with many different castes and ethnic differences that contributes to the challenges that they face. So uh, Courtney was recommending or pointing out that, you know, better understanding of mental health issues and the things that can proactively be done uh, is will be critical as they move forward to rebuilding their lives and replanting um, the farms that they need and, and rebuilding their homes. Nepal is a, a, a poor country uh, economically, and many of, of younger men in particular have gone overseas to other countries to uh, bring the money that is needed to, to fund their lives, and they send this back as in the form of remittances. So they are not there in many cases to help rebuild, and that adds to the challenge uh, that, that they're facing. Another one of our team members, uh, this is uh, Jan Kupek. Uh, he uh, is a specialist in, in many things, but landslides in particular. And landslides are, are a very important aspect of what occurs in, in Nepal, unfortunately, quite frequently, not just as a result of earthquakes, but just due to the very, very steep terrain that exists throughout the country. Um, so we uh, we were quite interested in understanding several aspects of that, uh, one of which is when a community, uh, say a village, has been uh, hit by a landslide like this one that you see in the center of the picture, this unfortunately buried uh, a village and uh, many people's lives were lost. The, the girl in the far right here, she was actually swept into the, the landslide and uh, buried, but fortunately she was extricated and, and saved, but uh, she is uh, still quite traumatized by that. Fortunately her mother in the picture here was not in the village at the time, and, and so unlike the rest of their family, uh, they're both still alive. They, uh, they moved this village uh, uh, to a, a spur in the distance there, and uh, we were interested in, in whether that was a safe location um, because when we got to the top of this cliff, we could see in this red dashed line, and as it propagated a tar along the cliff, that the landslides will continue and, and probably not too far in the future. Um, but our conclusion was that they won't affect the relocated village. So ERI's goal is to provide advice uh, in a simple way to aid post-earthquake safety evaluations for communities threatened by landslides. So Jan uh, has pointed out that uh, most of the geotechnical issues were outside of the Kathmandu Valley uh, in the rural areas. And, and you know, 
know, related to rock falls and land cleavage. Based on his experience in Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, the effects of these are going to be felt by many for many years. Um, we also noticed pretty heavy evidence of ridge amplification, and this is something that's not well addressed in, in many countries, including the U.S. So it's uh, it'd be important to see if we can move forward with addressing that issue as we uh, begin to rebuild, both there and as we think about it in our own country. Uh, Ganesh Jimmy is a uh, colleague of Surya's at INSET, and his specialty is emergency response. And so he looked at how that worked, both in the community, from a national point of view. There were a number of international search and rescue teams that came in. Uh, one of the things that he put together that I thought was quite interesting here is that there were a very large number of people who were pulled out alive by the people directly in the community immediately following the event. And, and as you can see from the numbers here, that is dramatically larger than the number of people who were saved by international search and rescue teams, which obviously couldn't get there as quickly. So it raises some interesting questions about uh, timing of search and rescue and, and the, the cost benefit of, of resource allocation. So he has recommended that you know, every community, at, at the, even at the sort of smaller level, have uh, a search and rescue squad, and that um, as we go up in the scale of the size of administrative districts, that they're uh, more trained and, and more qualified. I think many of things worked well uh, in Nepal. There was a lot of uh, planning, but but his feeling is really from top to bottom. There's there's certainly room for improvement preparedness. I think uh, understanding where uh, is the best place to go in an event um, in when you have very poor building stock, such as the unreinforced masonry bearing wall building, is a, an interesting question that we're not fully uh, clear on, on where that the best way to go is. So he's recommending studies on that, uh, comparative studies of, of the best way to do search and rescue or another example of suggestion. Uh, one of Nepal's most important features, I think, is its uh, spectacular cultural heritage with the many temples and monuments that are uh, around uh, the country, including the capital of Kathmandu, but in other areas. And I think before I went, the, the media reports uh, were uh, very depressing in that the sense of you got the feeling that the entire uh, heritage had been lost. Uh, and so it turns out that's not the case. Uh, there have certainly been tragic losses. Uh, you can see here in Patan, this is Darber Square, their downtown area, a little historic area where this is what it was before, and and uh, the two buildings in the foreground were lost, but you can see many uh, different kinds of temples still remain. Uh, the same thing happened in a uh, similar square in downtown Kathmandu and, and in other areas. So it's the performance varies. And, uh, part of the interesting issues, at least from a structural engineering point of view and a preservation point of view, or which ones uh, did well and, and why. So there are many questions. I mean, the scale of what's occurred is, is vast. Um, um, almost a huge number of monuments were significantly damaged. So one key question will be, will we rebuild those monuments in the traditional way uh, with traditional techniques? and historic materials, or some form of enhancement, perhaps some you know, measure of, of seismic strengthening and, and more modern materials uh, inside of the rebuilt areas, uh, will that be done or not? That, that poses challenging questions for the profession and, and uh, for preservationists. There's a huge scale, and so there's a huge issue of funding. Uh, how, where will the money come from? Do this. There have been some promising donations uh, that have come forth in, in recent months, but uh, we will see. I think that it would be valuable to do pilot studies before a very large program is done to, to best understand and, and to leverage what is learned from one type of temple to use it in a similar type uh, moving forward. I think in, in deep, really, you know, better research of understanding the nuances will serve the country well moving forward. 
John Bevington and, and a number of other people on the team looked at, at building code issues. Um, so here's an example of a, a high-end apartment building on the outskirts of Kathmandu that was permitted for 12 stories, but if you count them up there, um, below ground and above, there are 17. Um, so this is apparently not an entirely unique case. So permitting exists, but is not always followed. Um, the building code exists and has been around for quite a long time, since 1994, but, uh, and this is a relatively new school. Uh, it's a reinforced concrete frame building that has masonry infill. So if we look at an example of one of the columns in the front here, and we blow it up, and then we blow it up further, we can see 90-degree hooks. So we can see the center bar here doesn't have cross ties. We can see very wide spacing that is almost uh, to the to the effective depth of, of the column itself. So this is non-ductile detailing in a relatively recent building that's not consistent with the code. So perhaps uh, more critical than improvements to the code is, is simply implementing the code. Uh, there is a, a plan for adoption. Uh, it, it is required uh, based on a national law, but a deadline has not been set. So the level of adoption and, and implementation throughout the country vary significantly. Um, but we saw a lack of code compliance in, in many areas. I think like many events uh, around the world, now is the time uh, to capitalize on, on misfortune here and, and implement a, a more effective uh, level of code use throughout the country while, while there is time. Rachel Davidson looked uh, at lifelines, uh, was able to interview and visit uh, with many of the officials from you know, the electricity, uh, utilities, to look at water, wastewater, how the communications uh, uh, systems were working. We were able to talk with individuals who run the, the national airport in Kathmandu and then discuss you know, road issues. And uh, she has a, a thorough presentation that goes in detail about kind of the state of what these different lifelines were prior to the earthquake and then what occurred in the earthquake as well. And uh, some kind of preliminary findings for that is that in, in the larger cities, the effect on consumers was smaller. Um, they already have uh, load shedding issues where at some times there is a lack of electricity for up to 12 hours or even more a day. So people are used to being able to uh, go on their, with their lives with limited electricity. Portable generators exist in, in many people's um, buildings. Uh, they have challenges with water supply, so there's workarounds that existed before that. It looks like the bigger effects were in rural areas. Unlike some other parts of, of the more developed world, there are limited interdependencies between the different utilities, so that that made building back and, and their effect uh, less pervasive than it probably would have been otherwise. The landslides that I mentioned earlier uh, certainly impacted the utilities in a significant way, and, and they will continue as the monsoon rains, which have begun uh, to make uh, more landslides. Uh, the last topic is resilience. This was uh, addressed by um, a number of people in team, but, but primarily by Chris Poland. And uh, here is kind of an overview, giving you a feeling for kind of the typical framework and time scale of what occurs uh, prior to an earthquake. Are we prepared in the short term uh, after the earthquake? Uh, we were there kind of know, in the, in the weeks period, and, and what we could see is that in Kathmandu, the, the level of shaking was probably a little bit less than they had been expecting for a very large event, and the level of recovery by the time we were there was, was substantial, although there were certainly pockets of, of significant uh, devastation, but, but it, was, it was very pocketed. Uh, whereas in some of the heavier uh, shaken districts, entire villages had very significant issues and the level of shaking was extreme and they're still in the beginning of recovery. So this compiles uh, a uh, 
a set of resilience recommendations related to different sectors of the infrastructure in the community. And uh, just to highlight a few, I think it's, as we mentioned in other areas of this presentation, it's, it's very important for people to appreciate the value of building to the code and the benefits that that will come. Uh, we think improved training and licensing of contractors will go a long way, as will more rigorous plan review and inspections. Um, the, they had challenges getting uh, material into the country uh, because there's really only one international airport and it had limited capacity, although they were pretty heroic in what they were able to, to work around there. But improvements are planned and will be beneficial, as is adding redundancy and, and robustness to all the other different uh, utility lifelines. So these have implications you know, around the world, including the United States. Uh, so Chris's feeling is that you know, resilience begins with saving lives. That's, that's our most important um, goal. We need to have access uh, for to get to people into critical facilities. Performance-based building codes will be beneficial uh, as well as more resilient lifeline systems. So there are a list of reasons. References. All the other uh, presentations provide, you know, a much longer list of references for their longer presentations. So I would encourage those if you're interested to check those out. Uh, so the ERI team uh, benefited from an extensive number of people who assisted us, uh, different organizations, different individuals. Uh, there's ERI itself, which for nearly 50 years has been sending teams like ours to, to major events. I think this was a good choice because there were many interesting issues that we learned in Nepal that could be applied to other areas of the world. Uh, we partnered, as I mentioned earlier, with NSET, which was extremely successful. ERI staff, uh, Heidi Tremaine was the project manager, and, and many other people uh, provided uh, wonderful help in planning and organizing and, and reviewing and assisting with presentations as we move forward. The, uh, this presentation, as I mentioned at the beginning, has, has drawn from others. Uh, so I would encourage you to take a look at that uh, long list and, and find the presentations that are of particular interest to you or perhaps something new that, that you may not be as familiar with. Uh, I certainly learned a lot, and, and I hope others do as well. Uh, you can uh, not only look at ERI's briefing series, of which this is a part, but you can go to ERI's Virtual Clearing House website for a significant amount of, of excellent information, including all those geotagged photographs that I mentioned. We'll be producing a report later in the year. There are curated topics that our collaborators and partners from all over the world are helping put together. Our virtual team collaborators have assisted in that effort. So I would encourage you to take a look at that as well. So thank you for your time, and I hope this has been enjoyable.